Thank you, Daniela. Good to be with you. So there's a familiar quote in information security that given a choice between dancing pigs and security, <laughs> users will choose dancing pigs every time. Fortunately, in the security field, this dim view of clicky losers is changing to recognize that usable security actually has a lot to do with users' security decisions. And at the Neural Security Lab at Brigham Young University, we're finding that this quote is unfair on an entirely different level, namely the neurobiological level. The way our brains work biases much of our behavior, even security behavior, without our being conscious of it. And in this talk, I'll talk about different ways that different neural processes that influence our behavior that sometimes makes us the weakest link in the security chain. And I'll talk about three different phenomena, namely dual task interference, habituation, and generalization. And I'll also offer a few suggestions on what you can do to make your security UI more usable. But first, watch this video and look for an example of a mental bias. Marsha, what happened? Peter hit me in the nose with a football. I can't go to the dance like this. Well, I'm sure it was an accident, sweetheart. An eye for an eye. That's what Dad always says. I never said that, honey. Shut up! Time to teach Peter a lesson. Marsha, eat a Snickers. Why? You get a little hostile when you're hungry. Better? Better. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Jan, this isn't about you. <laughs> it never is. <laughs> All right, how many of you noticed the security message pop up in the upper right-hand corner of the screen? My show of hand. OK, most people don't notice it. That's because our brain is engaged in a task, namely processing the video, that we don't see this message pop up. And this is an example of dual task interference. This describes a situation in which multiple tasks are attempted at the same time, and interference occurs in the brain. Most people think they're very good at multitasking, but the truth is we're all bad at it. When multiple tasks are attempted at the same time, interference in the brain occurs, and performance on all of the tasks suffers. Now, in the security field, this has implications, real implications, I think, because security messages are triggered by system events without regard, most of the time, for what the user is doing. This makes interruptions inevitable, which means that when a security message is displayed to a user, dual task interference is likely occurring in the brain. So this sounds bad, but how bad is this problem? Well, that's what we set out to discover at the Neural Security Lab. We conducted an fMRI experiment to examine what happens in the brain when a security message interrupts another task. To do this, we conducted an experiment with multiple conditions. First, we had a baseline or resting condition in which the subject did nothing, and we did this as a point of reference for our other conditions. Then we had a memory task condition in which our participants were required to memorize a seven-digit code like this one and then later recall that code from a list of other codes, like this. It's actually not so easy, it, it takes some work. Then we had them complete a separate security task in which they responded to a warning similar to a permission warning that you'd experience in Chrome when installing a software extension. These permission warnings display permissions that the extension is requesting to access or modify data. And we previously trained our users in the experiment about risky and safe permissions in the context of our experiment. And we considered that a user disregarded a message if they decided to install an extension that contained a risky permission. So this took some work, too, in terms of working memory and long-term memory. Then we had a separate high dual task interference task in which they had to do both tasks at the same time. First, they had to memorize the code, then respond to the security message, and then finally recall the code from the list. Now, in working tasks like this one, when we're relying on memory, we depend on the medial temporal lobe, which includes several brain structures, including the hippocampus and amygdala. And when interference occurs in the brain, we would expect that our ability to access these regions of the brain would be inhibited. And in fact, that's what we found. So in this graph here, the color blue indicates decreased neural activity in the high dual task interference condition when users had to memorize the code and respond to the security warning. 
So decreased activity in the medial temporal lobe relative to the condition where responding to the warning was the only task. And in fact, it wasn't just neural activity that was affected, but also their behavior. Participants were three times worse in, re in appropriately responding to the message in this high dual task interference condition than they were when they responded to the warning alone. And in fact, we could predict this behavior based off of their neural activity in the medial temporal lobe. It's interesting. Now we ask the question, well, what would happen if we finesse the timing of the warning so that instead of interrupting a task, it follows directly on the heels of a task? In this case, we found that performance in responding to the security message was almost as good as when responding to the message was the only task. So this indicates that the timing of a warning really does make a difference in how users respond. So to apply these findings outside of the laboratory, we conducted a field experiment using Google Chrome. Now some permission warnings or some security warnings can't be delayed. If you see this message and you disregard it, you continue past the warning to a site, the likelihood is very high that you will visit a site that's currently serving malware. But on the other hand, some security messages aren't tied to a specific event. For example, this is the Chrome cleanup tool prompt in Google Chrome. And this message is displayed on Windows systems when Chrome detects malware or adware that has changed the internet settings or Chrome's browser settings. And it asks for permission of the user to please let it remove the malware and restore the system to its original settings. So this is an important message, but it's not tied to a specific event. And so this is a good candidate for a message that could be delayed for a better time, when the user is more likely to respond to the message. So in coordination or collaboration with the Google Chrome security engineers, we identified good and bad times to present this, this message during the, the normal course of web browsing experience, or in other words, high and low dual task interference times. For example, the video I showed you a few minutes ago, that's an example of a high dual task interference time. This is not a good time to present a message. And in contrast, we, we identified better times, low dual task interference times, such as after a video completes, or waiting for a page to load, or waiting for a web-based task to complete, like a download or an upload or, or something that's processing. These are good times to present a message because the user is less engaged. We conducted an Amazon Mechanical Turk experiment with Chrome users, and we randomized 850 users across these nine different conditions of high versus low dual task interference. And we found that overall that users in the low dual task condition were significantly less likely to disregard the message. In the high dual task condition, users disregarded the message 80% of the time. And in the low dual task condition, users regarded, disregarded the message only 36% of the time, which is a 45% reduction. So pretty substantial. So some takeaways from this experiment. First of all, the brain isn't good at handling interruptions. So if your UI is displayed without regard to what the user is currently doing, then interruptions will be inevitable. And that means that interference will likely occur in the brain as a result, and your users will be less equipped to respond to that security UI. The second takeaway is that the timing of a security message really does make a difference, and in our experiments, we saw a marked improvement in just finessing the timing. So if you have any insight at all into what the user is doing, the workflow of the user, display the message at a time when the user is less engaged. Now the next neural bias I want to talk about, or, or neural process, is called habituation, which is decreased response to a repeated stimulus. And this phenomenon has been observed in all animal life, including simple animal life like the California sea slug. And it's also been observed in the human brain. Now this is important in the context of security because with each display of a warning, our brain pays less and less attention until finally we stop seeing the warning, kind of like familiar wallpaper. This is also known as warning fatigue or warning blindness. And this is bad, but how bad is this problem? So to investigate, we conducted another fMRI experiment in which we displayed 40 real-world warnings in the fMRI machine scanner. 
And we found that in areas of the brain associated with visual processing, we saw a dramatic drop in activity after only the second exposure to a warning, with, successive, um, with each successive exposure even further drop off. And that's what the top half of this graph shows. And in contrast to that, at the same time, we're seeing a ramp up in activity in areas of the brain associated with boredom or inat inattention. So people are paying less and less attention with each successive display. And then we examined what could we do to mitigate this effect. And we tried using a polymorphic warning or a warning that changes its appearance with each exposure. And we found that in this case, in addition to these, these graphical variations, we also use animations like twirl, zoom, and jiggle. So it seems silly, but when we applied this experiment, when we look at the results, we found a dramatic difference that habituation happened at a substantially slower rate for the polymorphic warning than for traditional warnings that don't change their appearance. We also used our neural data to show the top four variations of these polymorphic variations. This is what were most effective. Now we did a follow-up experiment that went beyond a one-hour laboratory session because habituation happens over time. So we looked at this over the course of a work week, five days, and we found the same pattern of habituation, decrease in attention over time. We also saw an increase of attention from one day to the next. But this increase in attention, this recovery, wasn't enough to offset the overall decline of attention over time. But we did see that the polymorphic warning, again, sustained higher attention across the work week. And it wasn't just neural data that gave us this insight. We also, at the same time, collected eye tracking data with an MRI-compatible eye tracker. And using this eye data, this eye gaze fixation data, we see the same pattern. Overall decline across the work week, but sustained attention for the polymorphic warning. Now, to test this outside of the laboratory, we conducted a mobile field experiment. And this was useful for two reasons. One is, we, one reason was that we were able to extend the window of analysis from one week to three weeks, so that's good. But also, instead of just measuring attention in terms of where the eye is looking or what the brain is responding to, we wanted to measure actual behavior. So to do this, we designed an Android app store and required users to visit this app store and install three apps from a category of apps every day for 15 days. And when they did this, when they chose an app to install, they saw a permission warning like this. And this warning uh, would, again, list permissions that the app was requesting to access or modify data. And if they ignored the warning with a risky permission, then we considered that they disregarded the message. And to make this easier for users, we created four scary permissions. These permissions should be bad or inappropriate for any category of app. So in this case, we, had, we randomly assigned users to a static condition in which, like all other warnings, the warning appearance did not change. And then we assigned them other users to a polymorphic condition where the, the appearance of the warning changed throughout the 15 days. We found after three weeks that those in the polymorphic condition performed substantially better in responding to the warning. In fact, the difference by the end of the experiment was 21% in adherence to the message. So that, again, is not attention. This is actual behavior that this translated to. So a takeaway, one is that the brain is wired to tune out stimuli that it has experienced before. And that means that you need to be judicious in the number of times you display warnings to a user. The second is that updating the appearance of a UI actually makes a difference. It, it makes a substantial difference. We've seen this in the field and in the laboratory across multiple different methods. Now, the third neural phenomenon that I want to discuss is called generalization, or in other words, generalization of habituation. This describes a situation in which you become heavily habituated to one stimulus, and then you encounter a new stimulus, and that habituation carries over because the two stimuli share visual similarity. And I think this has real relevance to the security field because one of the basic principles of 
user interface design is visual consistency. So on the screen behind me, you see two different dialogue messages. One is a security message, the other isn't. And yet, they look very similar. So this is a danger when you consider that system notifications and dialogue messages are very common. We experience these all the time on our mobile devices, on our computers. And the danger potentially is, is if that habituation to those common notifications carry over to relatively rare security messages. We learn at an early age that the way to get work done on a computer is to dismiss interruptions that pop up in our face. Just get rid of them quickly. In fact, I was watching my, my two-year-old son use an iPad. When I saw this, I thought, how early do I have to start studying people and how they respond to warnings? I mean, he didn't pay attention to that. That was automatic. He, he can't even read. He just dismissed that thing. <laughs> now, to be fair to him, that was a system notification. That was not a security message. But the potential danger is, is that when this automatic response to something that pops up in your face carries over to a relatively rare security message, especially when the mode of interaction or the visual appearance is similar. So this sounds bad, but how bad is this problem? Well, we don't know yet. We've collected pilot data, and this is what we're studying next in the next few months. But if habituation theory holds, if this is true as we suspect, then what would be some takeaways? The first is that people probably habituate to system notifications that are frequent, and that this habituation carries over to security events that are rare. And what this means is, is that a user may already be deeply, deeply habituated to a security message that they have never seen before just because they're used to responding to dialogue messages in general. And what this implies is that we should design security messages to have a different visual appearance or even a different visual mode, different mode of interaction than simply what I call click to dismiss so that users don't automatically respond to that. To respond to security messages in the same way. And overall, across these, these neural phenomena and these experiments, when we look at this all together, what we find, or what, what I believe, is that rather than just training users to be more vigilant or being more aware of security threats, that our security UI should be designed to be compatible with the way our brains work, that it works with the way that our brains work and not against it. And it also shows the potential of using neuroscience to understand users' security behaviors and to test and evaluate UI designs. And I think that it also suggests that not only do security engineers like yourselves need to worry about attackers, but they also need to worry about the neurobiology of their users, which in many cases is working against users in responding appropriately to security messages. Thank you.